All right. Uh, this is another episode of Sorry for Rambling with me, Alex Kack. And today I am joined by actor and I'm going to call you my friend, Chris Reed. Uh, Chris, yeah. thanks for being here. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, you're... Where are you? Where are you at currently? You're in California. Which city are you in right now? Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles in a suburb called North Hollywood. It's nothing ah. like Hollywood. Now that that Los Angeles is uh, where actors like to congregate, so that makes sense. Um, how are so? I mean, let's start with the obvious thing. Uh, it's April second. Uh, shit is weird. How are things out there? How are you and your family doing? We're doing okay. Uh, we actually, we have a toddler. So uh, we've kind of got endless entertainment, at, at, you know, at our beck and call. Uh, we're healthy. Nobody's shown anything, you know, uh, virus related. So that's good. We're holed up. We, we've got a place to stay. We're, we're secure in that way. So I think we're, we're doing about as best as you can. I'm infinitely happy to hear that. Um, so, I mean, it's it's weird to record one of these right now. This is the first one I've done since all of this started, and it's it feels almost impossible to like not talk a little bit about about the pandemic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fucking pandemic. It's a fucking pandemic, uh, and it's a real one. It's not. It's, this is not some bullshit swine flu thing. Uh, yeah. I, I had swine flu in '09. I was like one of the first confirmed cases in Arizona. That sucked. This oh, is. Wow. Do you, do you have your button? I should. You know, I should have got like a chip or something. I did get <laughs> like I did get like quarantined. It was my senior year of high school. I got like, quarantined from the campus for like months. Like I was like only sick for like I don't know like a week or something. I think. And they, like, I was, like, not allowed within a certain number of feet of the school property or, like, certain other, like, I don't know, like, public areas that were, like, designated for, like, a, like a specific period of time. Like, I got, like, a letter from the school district that was, like, like stay the hell away. Um, it was weird because, like, I lived down the street, so I was, like, I'd be, like, going about my business and I'd just be, like, walking across the street from it because I think that was, like, the amount of feet I was allowed to be. Um, this is a whole different thing, though. Like, um, there is no, there is no school for these kids now um, because yeah. people are actually really dying. Um, being an actor uh, in a time like this, I mean, how does it impact, you know, what you do? I mean, how does it impact finding work, what you were working on? Like what's going on with that? Well, our industry was one of the first ones to shut down, you know, uh, major studios. It cost a ton of money to have something in production. So at the first sign of they're hearing, you know, quarantines and, and the thing shutting down, they pulled the plug really, really fast. So uh, I want to say second week of March is when we started seeing production shut down. And when that happens, everything goes away. I'd imagine the only people who are really in our industry who are really working right now are the writers. Because I know you can still have a writer's room uh, digitally, you know, and you can still write stuff down. So I'm pretty sure they're 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 still uh, some of them are still getting paid and still on their respective productions. But acting's shut down. My wife works in what they call a prop house. It's where every like if uh, if we had to shoot a scene in Alex's apartment, they would have rented those books back behind you from there they would have rented all your furniture all that stuff would have been rented from a house and, and it's just a giant warehouse in the middle of the valley and nobody's coming in they've shut down she got laid off so that's this whole industry which is a big part of this town and first off i'm i'm really sorry to hear uh that your wife got laid off and i mean i hope there's work for her again soon um that, yeah, that goes without saying. When her company starts back up, she'll go back to work. Perfect. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, the one thing I think we're can say for sure is that uh, there's going to be entertainment after this. Um, we're probably going to need it. Yeah, we can't watch Tiger King for the next ten years. No, <laughs> I, you know, I haven't seen it yet. I'm, ho I'm holding out. I just want to let the whole thing get spoiled for me. Uh, <laughs> did you watch it? 
No, I, I we I can't do any of the true crime stuff. It's just not for me. Like I know it's a whole thing uh, in the Zeke guys this thing to jump on the loot the the newest case of trash people doing terrible things, but I like the fictionalized versions of that. Well, you know, I like I obviously I pay attention to politics, and one of the things I really love paying attention to are these like really bizarre like minor presidential candidates who like file but they don't actually run and so like the guy at the center of the tiger king thing he yeah. did that in 2016 well I and he would really I, 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 see I, I read a lot of news not necessarily all politics i mean all news and i remember that i remember reading about him at the time and his lifestyle and how it was kind of a joke uh, and then I'm pretty sure he got arrested for something. I can't remember what. I feel like it might have been drugs. But I'm not watching the show. I'm going off of my memory. And uh, don't hold me to any of the factual stuff there. He could be dead. <laughs> he might be dead. I don't know. Yeah, I honestly wouldn't know. I like. I just. I remember he would put these crazy YouTube videos out, and uh, yeah, and I, I can't imagine the show is as good as yeah. as the content that like he produced himself. Uh, so let's, I mean, let's, let's, let's move away from what, what, uh, the horror show that is life in, in 2020. Let's talk about your career. Um, <laughs> <That's another laughs> show, my <laughs> um, so I, I arguably, I think that your, your biggest role was probably Sons of Anarchy. Would it's you agree with that? Yeah, it's 30 something episodes. And I think I've done close to to 45 or 50 total of everything so it's the it's the biggest ticket for sure what was that experience like um i mean obviously that was a that was a huge hit show what was it like to be a part of that ensemble cast um it was really insane it was my first job in tv so i mean it was literally just kind of getting dropped into the river and trying to swim figure it out as you go I, you know and it's about bikers and uh, I'm not you know, outlaw bikers, not your your weekend warrior type or or motorcycle enthusiast. Uh, it's about outlaw hardcore bikers who sell guns and drugs and all sorts of gnarly stuff. Uh, so it, it was kind of different getting launched into that environment as well as just, uh, you know, it's fictional, but there's also this weird like, uh brackish waters of mixing the two worlds so which isn't my personality and had to do that um i mean would you say that that i mean aside from just the the kind of notoriety that being a part of a show that big gives you i mean i mean what as an actor or as a person did you take away from the experience overall well, you, uh, like, I learned a ton about working on a set, number one. That, like, it, it was the best damn, uh, you know, acting school or how to act on film school you can really ask for. You got uh, Ron Perlman, Kim Coates, and some real heavy hitter actors that you go to work with every day and you get to watch them. And that, that was tremendously helpful and probably the, the biggest thing I got to take away from it. As far as uh, yeah, I mean, what's what's being around Ron Perlman like in in real life? It's a hoop man. He's a great follow on Instagram, by the way. If uh, in these times of boredom, Ron <laughs> Perlman's Instagram is nonstop entertainment. He's a storyteller. He loves old Hollywood. Uh, he used to just tell us all these weird little anecdotes about you know Billy Wilder and and what movies he's a. Uh, He's one of those people that uh, knows where all the good pizza is in town. He'll tell you where to the, the best place to go for, uh, you know, a meatball sandwich. He's just a, a bon vivant, you know. It is, it is interesting. I feel like, I mean, Ron Perlman is is a good example of someone who like continuously plays these like kind of hard ass characters. Yeah, but. Yeah. When you like see him as a person, he does not. He doesn't strike me, at least in interviews and such, as that kind of uh, individual. Is I mean, is that true to life, or I mean, is he really like a scary guy? No, no, he's got that face. You know, that face is the thing that earns all that all that villain money. Kind of like Danny Trejo, who's one of the nicest dudes you can ever imagine. 
Um, I mean, is that... Would you say that that's overall true? I mean, of the entire cast of a program like that. I mean, you know, these are people. These are obviously these are these are artists going to work to portray something, but in such a kind of gritty crime drama, where's the where's the overlap? Where do the lines kind of blur? Where like, well, that's that's kind of the you know th- that was one of the weird things about it. Truth be told, is uh, uh, never in like the actions of what people were doing like guys weren't getting off of work and going out and doing criminal acts but kind of the attitude that everybody had like w- was kind of blurry in between uh you know just showing up to work and living in a fictionalized town in northern california and doing all sorts of nefarity uh it, it was just kind of it was new to me I'm pretty sure other actors have seen uh, the whole uh, uh, what's the, the the Apocalypse Now documentary. Uh, oh God, Heart of Darkness. Yeah, you know where you get a little in too deep, uh, and it seems sometimes on that show that some of the people were were going there, but uh, yeah, it's just kind of weird. <laughs> Honestly, I, I don't know how else to put it. It was just kind of bizarre and. Uh, you go home and start playing video games and you think about like, wait, wow, there was some testosterone flying around the set today that, you know, we kind of in the biker world for a second. <laughs> what is, a? I mean, what's your favorite memory of being a part of that project? Oh, um, I'm just going to, I can't go favorite because I'll just go what popped into my head right away. Uh, one day we were smoking a joint in the parking lot and it was getting down to like the, the lower bits of it. And I think I was on my first, maybe the second season. I don't know if I would have been so brash if I hadn't been around there and, and my mustache caught fire as I started, as I put it. So, and like, right as that happened, the boss, the, the showrunner, executive producer, of the show came walking by and I literally inhaled the joint. Like it was a, like it was a fucking sitcom or something uh, like that. That's not something I'll ever forget. Um, <laughs> I, I have like flashes of like riding in the pack. That was always a lot of fun. Um, and then getting to know a few of the guys, you know, hanging out after Charlie's a great dude, very generous spirit. Um, yeah. That that show specifically, and I think maybe last point on it, uh, I mean, it, it has a really intense kind of fandom uh, in a way that, like, I feel like you tend not to see that other than, like, with, like, science fiction and fantasy, but it had a, it had a very dedicated and loyal almost cult following, and it still does. Uh, I mean... Do you interact with fans of that of that program? Do you do you keep in touch? Do you go to events? What's it like if you do? Yeah, well, I mean, it's funny you bring it up. It's like fantasy, and yeah, there's like these really uh, cultish is another good word. Just folks who are really passionate about it and really like have the show like uh, wash into their lives. Um, it, it can be healthy. Most, I'd say 90% of the folks are super sweet and super nice and can identify you as a, uh, as a, as a person who, you know, was an actor and doing a job. And then there's like 10% who, man, just don't, don't really get it. They saw it on their screen. So it's real, you know, uh, and that was, that was another eye opening. A lot of people believe what they see on TV. Like they think it is real shit. So you'll go, you know, I used to do more events than I do now. I, I I wasn't a huge part of the show and those events have to fly people out and then they want to make money off of everybody. So they usually go with the bigger names from the show. So I don't think I've done one in a couple years, but yeah, you used to have like dudes in motorcycle jackets, like walk up to your table and go like, I hate you, bro. You really bitched out that one time on the table. And it's like, wait, what the fuck? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry you hate me. And I bitched out. I did what was written on the page. I didn't have a I mean, it's 
that is like a i mean that's like a recurring thing that you hear actors talk about with these like big projects of of meeting people who cannot discern that like they are playing a role in in reading written work and they like they are not the character i think um, for the game of thrones people man like the the dude who played uh the dude who played oh god ramsey bolton uh, did you watch Game of Thrones? Oh, yeah, all the way through. Yeah, so the dude who had to play Ramsey Bolton, like the most sadistic, evil character. Like, you know people side-eye him. when they like, Oh, when definitely. Watch yeah, they're like, oh, can't trust that guy. I saw him castrate a dude once. It's like, no, no, <laughs> you didn't. You didn't see that. Well, I always think of he was, that, that same actor was on this, like, British teenage superhero show that like an ex-girlfriend of uh, mine like turned me on to and and he plays like the nicest guy he's like this like shy quiet adorkable superhero in that show <laughs> and it's like i saw that and then you see him in game of thrones um I, I feel like maybe like maybe there should be like a a direct link for people to like if an actor has to play like a really sadistic awful role like that there should be like a, a preview of them playing like a cheerier part beforehand yeah. like, <laughs> just, I, I know back in the olden times there used to be like disclaimers given of fear not thee in the audience what you see is not real it is pretend i don't know maybe we need to go back to something like that yeah i mean that might actually be it might be helpful for the broad population to like create a kind of a i don't know a dividing line in their brain between reality and fantasy yeah and i think part of it is i mean like what you what you do for a living feels so out of touch i think for for many people probably though it's it's a process maybe they don't understand um entirely uh and that might might be part of it i mean what is the day-to-day life of a tv and film actor like Kind of like this quarantine most of the time. <laughs> like you, sit at, you sit at home and ho- hope, for, hope for the next big audition to roll by. Um, I, I shouldn't say that entirely. There's lots of people who are far more proactive than me and have more industry. And, uh, you know, I've, I've tried to write. I've done all the tropes. Uh, and you're right. It's like any other industry. Like, none, I don't know how you know, fucking Hershey bars get made. Like when I see it, it's this nice little package thing. I mean, it probably goes through a a couple miles of factory floor and in horrible temperatures and conditions before I ever see it. So yeah, you're right. I think, I think that's a part of it. It's just, you know, and you have to know this a little bit too, because you achieved some accidental fame. Kind of, you know, just like after a meeting you went to one night. Yeah. So, like, it, it's just kind of a, it's hard for people to relate to unless you've kind of been through it. Uh, like, I, 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 I have so much more appreciation for athletes now. For, like, guys who get drafted in the sixth or seventh round of the NFL. They get signed to minimum contracts. They'll play three to five years and fans will cuss their names. They will say they hate them. They will wish for them to get fired. They will wish for them to get injured just because, you know, it doesn't satisfy their desires in the moment. I mean, fame is a, it's a weird and kind of like fickle (laughs) thing to deal with i I mean it's because it i mean in my like very limited level of like experience with it i mean people are wonderful and it's like one of the best things that's ever ever happened to me is getting to meet people who i mean mean, fan might not be the right word but yeah like fan like like yeah i I hear you exactly yes but like it you know it is the same thing i mean like i when i was you know go to events like do a meet and greet or something and it's like you have a line of people like paying to take photos with you and like 99 out of a hundred of them are like the coolest, like most awesome people in the world. And then like someone is like 
drunk and like trying to like you know feel you up or like you know threatening to kill you or like just something yeah insane on so it shows that multiplies by about 10 i think there's yeah about I, 90 as opposed to 99 yeah, I, I figure. Yeah, it's got to be with, with a biker show. Like the, both the levels of people that like want to sleep with you and want to murder you, probably are like exponentially grow. Yeah, it, it, it's weird, man. Like the the mur- I remember I did a bike week out in Arizona, and I had one of the scariest encounters ever. This dude was off. He obviously like off his medication. And like it was after the event was over and I was in a restaurant and he came over and sat at the table I was at. And like, I remember there was a dude who was supposed to be like the security guard and he just like, wasn't paying attention. So there's this dude like four feet away from me across the table, like asking me if I can see his soul and you know how black it is. And I'm just like freaking eject button. How do what happens? I'm thinking over, okay, if he makes a move, I flip the table over. Like, just going through all the, you know, John Wick scenarios in my head. And uh, and then you have just people wanting to just get to know a little bit about their favorite show in the world. And those those are great. I, I love when that happens. So if, if Sons of Anarchy is your biggest project you've been attached to what was your i mean what was your favorite project you've been attached to oh wow coming with the good questions i've had a few like really great gigs that i i loved um eastbound and down comes to mind because i love that show and i love danny mcbride so getting to audition for that and then getting cast in it and then flying out to north carolina and shooting it was just a great week i loved it I, I did a movie that I got to spend a month in Oklahoma City a couple years ago. That w- it was just a rad experience. I loved being there the whole time. It was a fun, goofy movie called The Turkey Bowl. Um, and then Enlightened on HBO was another just beautiful script. And I got to play a really lovely character and work with Luke Wilson. And, you know, those, those, those three were fun. Um, it, it's hard though because I can I can I can say great things about all the jobs I've did. I've I, I love TV. I, I love movies. So getting to go on a set is really just a great day for me. Like when when I know I have a call time and I'm going to work, like that's going to be an awesome day. Like uh, one of the worst days at work was with uh, Charlie Sheen on Anger Management, and he was great, awesome set. I had food poisoning, was still stoked to be there, got the job done, don't eat smelly shrimp, kids. Um, I never, never, look, uh, never eat smelly shrimp. Never eat smelly shrimp. Yeah, it's, I mean, that's like, I feel like that's one of the basic rules of life, right? Like, that's like the, that's the 11th commandment. I know. uh, You know, sometimes you just do things that are dumb. Oh yeah, no. I, trust me, I am a garbage person who's put a lot of garbage, questionable garbage food in my body. So I, I know that one uh, yeah. intimately. Um, okay, so we've got all of life is on hold for all of humanity right now. But when this is done, what type of work do you really want to pursue? Like, what what genres? Do you want to do TV more or film more? Do you want, are you looking to do comedy, drama? Like, what what's the thing that really makes Chris Reed want to pursue uh, the future? I, I want to, you know, honestly, Alex, the thing about this gig that is soul shattering is the security and not having it. That's that's the hardest part of it. There's, you know, just you, you come close to things that are like this is going to be me working for two three years and. Uh, I'll be able to actually save some money and we might be able to buy a house in Southern California. And then, you know, it takes one stumbled line and your confidence is gone and you never come close to that again. Or, I mean, it it takes a while for that to come back again. So, like, professionally, I want to be on a series and, uh, you know, television. 
that's that's what I watch the most of these days. Um, and that's where a lot of the best work is being done. There's still amazing movies everywhere every year. But uh, I feel like TV in the, the, the like serialized narrative form where we follow a story for six, seven years now is probably the most uh, powerful medium we got going. And that's what I'd, I'd like to do. You know, you mentioned the uh, the stability of, of work um, or lack of it. I, if I remember correctly, I think you tweeted something about about you know like healthcare in yeah. relation to to being an actor. I mean, yeah, uh, that was something I had never ever thought about before. Um, yeah. I think you know going back to what we kind of touched on earlier about i mean the what you do being so outside of you know, the kind of the average person's like worldview but but then like that is a way that like really for me like crystallized and brought it back home of like this is the same concern that everyone has yeah um and what options are there for like these kind of basic benefits for for people in a, it acting specifically but i mean i think in film and tv period all right well uh acting in the United States has two big unions. There's Actors' Equity and they do stage. You have to be a really prolific, super on top of your game stage actor to make a living as a stage actor. Like if somebody makes a living purely off a of stage actor, they're better than, I don't know, a quarter of the people on TV. Just because that is the craft. And it's hard to friggin' do, and you have to really love it uh, to to be able to do a go at it. And the other union is called SAG AFTRA. It used to be two unions, now it's one, and they cover all of uh, television, film, movies, all that. And uh, both unions have health plans, but you need to make a certain amount of money throughout the year to be eligible for them. That makes a lot of sense because SAG has something like 150,000 members. And of those members, I think 15,000, so somewhere in the range of 10 to 15%, will make that the minimum to qualify for health insurance. So if you had the union and the, and the health plan paying for 150,000 people, to have health insurance and they weren't having any money coming in, it wouldn't work. So you got to have these minimums. And uh, I didn't make enough this past year to qualify it. So that's what you saw on on Twitter. And uh, you, you then you're just like anybody else whose employer doesn't offer health insurance or health coverage. You got to hope to fall back on the social safety net or you just, uh, you know, Die broke. <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah, I mean that's it is. I mean that's uh that's uh, that's like the the you know whole theme of you know the news cycle pre virus was you know do you want your your union negotiated plan do you want to keep it or or, or do you want sick. yeah that whole line of thinking that whole choice. I, I loved Mayor Pete up until the moment he took that tack. Uh, it just makes me sick. Healthcare isn't, you know, clam chowder. There isn't four different cans of it on the shelf. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it, it's not your, it's not a Chardonnay. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Um, are you, I mean, obviously, I, I mean, I'm, Assuming you're not really working on anything at the moment, but yeah. you know, do you have anything that you know you are, I guess, yeah, for lack of a better term, working on? Were you working on anything before the virus broke out? I mean, is there is there something you want to plug? No, because the thing is, I'm I'm not like I said, I'm not one of those industrious folks that's able to create their own content. That's that's really like for all the young people out there find that monster inside yourself that will create stuff for you. I've tried really hard and I, you know, burned a lot of good anxiety fuel on it. Um, 
So I, I all the stuff I'm writing, nothing's close to anything anybody will ever see. And where I'm at in the industry, you know, kind of my my status is that which I don't know when my next job is coming months in advance. Almost never. It's almost I go into almost always I go into an audition on a Monday. I get called back on a Wednesday and then I'll have a fitting the next Monday and work however many days that following week. You know, Sons, I didn't know I was going to be in more than two episodes when I got it. And it wound up being three years. So you just don't know. Like, I remember picking up those scripts, trying to read through them as fast as I could to see if I got shot in the face, which I eventually did. Um, <laughs> Spoilers. Spoiler. Uh, so, no, I don't have much. I don't. That's that's the hardest part, man. I just don't know. I, I, I have faith in myself that I'll walk into a room and be someone that someone wants to put in a, on a project. But until the day that I start making my own stuff, yeah, I, I, I'll probably be on that short horizon for a long time. Well, I mean, you're an incredibly talented guy, so I, I see why you have the confidence. And when you do make something, I think we're all looking forward to it. Um, a couple questions I think about, I mean, one, when did you know you wanted to be an actor? High school, basically as soon as I started doing it. Were you doing theater in high school or like commercial acting? Yeah. Like, like what was yeah. the, what was the process? I grew up in San Diego, so I, I didn't grow up in LA, even though they're, they seem very close and similar. Um, I, I just, uh, did high school drama and loved it. It, it, I, you know, my father thought I was going to be a football player, as did a lot of people, and that wasn't really my bag. Really quickly, uh, but I loved drama club. You know, it was just where I can express myself and uh, and uh, be a little less reserved, I guess. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not very self conscious when I'm reading words somebody else wrote i guess well i mean that's a an incredibly rare talent so um you know is there if you uh, let's put it this way if you weren't acting what do you think you'd be doing oh shit like ideally or like do you want to do what you want yeah, yeah i mean i mean was there ever a backup was there ever a backup plan was there ever a moment of hesitation or a different thought well i grew up uh, in fishing. My father was a boat captain. My mom cooked in the galley. Uh, we, he worked on what they call sport fishing boats. San Diego's got the biggest fleet in, uh, I think, the world. And uh, they take people out fishing. It's not charter. You, you, know, you walk down, you buy a half-day ticket. We used to have lots of uh, folks from Arizona during the summer. And they take you out on a big 85 foot boat on the ocean and you fish for, you know, six hours. And then we bought an overnight tuna boat and I, I had a captain's license for a while. So that was kind of the industry I was born into. And I don't know if I would have ever left. I don't think so because I'm not educated. I, you know, never, never had the, the, the science knack. I loved biology, but I, I couldn't get into physics and chemistry and all the really uh, money-making stuff when it gets into STEM. Uh, so yeah, I'd probably be fishing, man. I might still, I might have my own boat right now, maybe, or I'd be cooking in a galley somewhere. I've got to be honest; that's one of the the more interesting answers to that question I think I've gotten on this show. Yeah. And yeah, and so I think one last question, and it's it's the it is the cheesiest, most cliche question possible, but I actually still think it's a valuable and important one, which is, you know, what what would you say to that kid in high school right now who's doing drama and just figuring out that they that they love acting and they want to do this? I mean, what what advice would you give them? What would you tell them? Work hard. You know, if you at, at everything you like doing, work hard. That's all it is. 
if um, you, know, you got to focus and you got to work. So when the other, this is what I did anyways in high school. I was really geeky about it. But, you know, when you'd be at a friend's house and uh, it with other people and you just kind of felt like you weren't being productive, just go read or go practice a monologue in the backyard. I just remember being a, such a geek about it and uh, constantly reading. I don't do it anymore because I'm an idiot, but... <laughs> Like the, that, that obsessiveness about what you like is what pays in the long run. That's how you build up um, the equity of, of of knowing what you're doing. Yeah. Well, and watch. It's amazing, Shit's Chris. Creek. Watch Shit's Creek and Catherine <laughs> O'Hara. Just and then just copy her. Whatever she does. <laughs> Whatever just just do is. Catherine O'Hara. <laughs> yeah, Catherine O'Hara. Well, Chris, Watch thank her. you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure, man. Well, thank you so much. All right, and stay in touch. Follow Chris Reed 619 on Twitter.